Thanks for joining us today. Reporting from the field near Tushi, Washington with Sky Cooley. Thanks for joining us. Let's get started. You know, if there is a type section for clastic dikes, this might be it too. It's as good an exposure or series of exposures in the Walla Walla Valley as anywhere in the greater Columbia Basin. And it's accessible and there's a lot of outcrop here. So it makes for a nice place to visit. Well, that's dramatic, that's for sure. So we're truly just two miles north of the little town of Tushi. That's right, yeah. yep. All right, well, anybody can come and take a peek then, I guess, huh? Yep, All and right. there are better outcrops for groups, but you know, this is a classic one, so we'll yeah. take a look here. So do you live nearby, or how do you know this place so well? <laughs> uh, let's see, so I don't live nearby. I live in Western Montana now. Okay. Um, I went to college here and I got introduced to clastic dikes and flood geology when I was in college. I did a undergraduate thesis on these dikes with a classmate of mine, Brian Pittick, uh -huh. and we worked with uh, Kevin Pogue at sure. Whitman College. Yeah. And Brian's moved on to bigger and better things and Kevin's moved on to bigger and better things with wine and vineyard, vineyard development. Okay. But yeah, yeah, I got my start here and yeah. So you were a geology major? Yep, I was. And what, uh, late 90s or what, what vintage? Yeah, mid 90s, yep. Okay, all right, nice. Well, help us with a, just a basic classic dike definition just verbally sure. first, sure. and then we can um, kind of get into the weeds here a little bit. Yeah, sure. So clastic dike, kind of a funny term, uh, two parts to it. Clastic meaning it's something filled with clastic material, uh -huh. so sediment. Yeah. And then dike, it cuts across strata. So clastic dike, a seam of sedimentary material that cuts across strata. And so in the Tushi beds, they are ubiquitous. And so you will find them everywhere you find this slack water facies. How's this look? This looks great, man. Okay, let's... You should have stretched out this morning. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you can kick a platform there, I'll kick a platform mm -hmm. here. Uh, and we can both fall off together. Oh, yeah. I think this way. <laughs> <clears throat> so, clastic dikes, uh, these dikes are the same age as the Missoula floods. So, no younger than, you know, 12,000 years old and no older than whatever people say the oldest floods in the Missoula cycle are. So, 20 something or 30 okay. something. Mm -hmm. So, fairly young. Uh, we're talking about unconsolidated sediment, right? So the host material, the surrounding material is unconsolidated. The fill is unconsolidated. And the cool part about these dikes, uh, in comparison to lots of other clastic dikes around the world, mm -hmm. is their sheeted character. There are other dikes around the world in certain places that do show this almost identical sheeting But, but, not, but, but not often, it's, mm -hmm. it's fairly rare. Okay. Um, oh, here, here you go. Little mouse fossil. <laughs> what the heck? Did you come over here last night and plant that? What the? <laughs> I just pulled it out of here. Oh my God. They call this uh, biology. <laughs> and people study it. I've heard of, I've heard of that. <laughs> heard of that stuff there called biology. Go. What? Put that back. Wait a minute. So that didn't come out of the dike. That's, well, that's an owl or something up here that's coughing that up. Yeah, that's not old. That's new. Gotcha. But but we digress. Well, you got your you got your mic on. You stay right there. I'm okay. just and we can still hear you even though I'm kind of going away from you here. So okay. We know we've got one of these dikes because it's. Are they typically vertical like this? These dikes. Yeah, mo most of the time they are sub-vertical. Now okay. there are sills and a lot of times they will wander in an outcrop and sometimes go from dike to sill to dike or okay. just dike to sill and then pinch out. Mm -hmm. um, but the general, it's tough maybe for us to see right now, but generally the, the Tushi beds or the slackwater sediments are semi-horizontal in right. here. That's right, semi-horizontal. There's, I don't know, 15 or so, maybe, maybe 15 to 20 
oh, individual yeah, you know, rhythmites here. I'm going to leave you for just a sec. Oh, you can come on with if yeah. you like. Let's, I, let's find yeah, it easier. Let's get a sense of that before we get into the... Okay, oh, good, God, damn. good. Look Oops, sorry, Patrick. I know there's a lot of a lot of detail to this outcrop. What I wanted to focus on is just the fills here. Sure. But whatever you think is a good way to frame well, this. Well, yeah, I, I think just the... Like here, to me, that's exciting to see this... Uh, how many how many tushi beds roughly here? Twenty or more? Yeah, maybe that many. It doesn't. When I count them, I I don't quite get that far, but okay. fifteen, twenty for sure. Yeah. And big picture thinking now. Um, it's generally interpreted these each of these slack water sediments or tushi beds as a separate ice age flood that came down from That's right. the north. So so if you think of we're just we're just north of Wallula Gap. Mm -hmm. So we've got downhill floods yeah. ponding up against Wallula Gap and then back flooding yeah. the Walla Walla Valley. Okay. All right. And, and there's plenty. Well, I don't know. Let me get to it right away. So there's plenty of places that we have filmed these, these slack water sediments stacked up like yeah, this, Burling Game and all sorts of places. Yep. Are you saying there's these clastic dikes pretty much? Um, hey. But yes, uh, in last year I put out a paper in the Tobacco Root Geological Society oh, guidebook. Oh, nice. And it lays out sort of the preliminary results of work I've done all over the Columbia Basin, the Greater Columbia Basin. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's a data set of about just shy of 500 sites. And at 300 or so of those, uh, there are clastic dikes. And every time you find clastic dikes you are within the ice age floodway and once you rise uh, above that local maximum flood level yeah. the elevation of wherever you are the local maximum yeah. you lose them and likewise when you move laterally outside of the floodway into sediments that are seemingly perfectly susceptible to all sorts of deformation you lose it we're in the floods country we've got these beautiful stacks of fine grain generally slack water sediments tushi beds from uh, in this case we're just up 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 a flow from Wallula Gap and you're saying we're finding dozens at every exposure of slack water sediments here in the Walla Walla Valley they are abundant okay in the Yakima Valley they are abundant yes. in the Pasco Basin they're abundant yeah South of Wallula Gap in the Umatilla Basin, they are abundant. They are. Less so because the coarse grain nature of the sediment there, mm -hmm. just because of the configuration of that basin, just swept uh, coarser grain sediments and a lot of Tushi beds aren't preserved well. Okay. But in the Willow Creek Valley, which is uh, on the way to Cecil, Oregon, the Hepner Highway, you have exactly this kind of uh, sediment deposited there in about 12 or so rhythmites. Um, well, we've teased it good enough now. I think we're ready to look at one of these. Okay. It's <laughs> uh, our on-the-fly version of how to get. Yeah. Let's get I mean, you good light. Uh, this I, is I hard. Do, I do like that sh the shade. Yeah, I, I think okay. where you were, you were before sounds okay. great. And okay. I just, I just felt like uh, you know how this works. I think the details are a little bit more meaningful once we get a little sense of of. Uh, but I didn't, I never thought of that, that once you really leave that flood path. Well, it, it, it's been a, it's been a surprise. I guess so. Uh, I wasn't, you know, when I started doing this work, I committed to doing this just to myself in the late 90s. I, I was frustrated with kind of the publications that were out there and mm -hmm. had some lingering questions from our own work mm -hmm. and was which just centered on nobody's even measured these things. There was a lot of discussion, a lot of interpretation, and I was guilty of it, uh, but no data, which is weird because we right. should be collecting. It right. is easy. It's right here. Right. But I don't know if people knew quite what to do. So what I've done is has been the same for since about the year 2000 when I started doing this is I simply visit every outcrop I can find of fine grain Pleistocene sediments, uh -huh. whatever their origin, and I take width measurements, so yep. the true width of this dike, okay. 
and I count the number of individual fill bands or sheets or dikelets that comprise that dike. So every dike along here that's well exposed, mm -hmm. I would count and measure. So I have eight field books full of those measurements, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, crazy. But the reason I've done that yeah. is one, because it's, it's kind of an adventure. You get to discover stuff all the time. Oh yeah. And people don't go to most of the outcrops I've been to. And it's great. Some mm -hmm. of them are just spectacular. Mm -hmm. But you also, the classic dike problem, and we recognize this, people recognize this in the 20s. It was a regional phenomenon, not a story that involves just the Tri-Cities area or just the Walla Walla area or just the Lewiston area. It's a region of 30,000 square kilometers. It's huge. It's most of Eastern Washington, part, portions of uh, Idaho and Oregon, all the way down the Columbia Gorge and the Willamette Valley. You've got dikes just like this in Salem, Oregon. You've got dikes just like this all the way north in the Columbia River Valley huh. near Hunters. Huh. You've got dikes just like this in Lewiston, Idaho, and as far west as White Swan in the Yakima Valley. So it's, it's not a small story and it needed, I felt like the, the right way to approach it is to characterize these dikes across the region they're distributed in. Yes. Right? So this is, this is a pet project. This is a hobby? Yeah, I just enjoy it. Yeah, it's, it's a contribution I think I can make. Mm -hmm. I had a couple motivations. Um, actually, to begin with, I saw a paper in 1998 that was published by a USGS geologist working in the New Madrid seismic zone, so Missouri. Oh boy. And he had a map where all he did was go to a few hundred outcrops, measure the features, yeah. their width, yeah. and then he plotted that as like scaled circles uh -huh. on the map. And from that data, he could reconstruct a damage halo from an old earthquake and sort of approximate the paleo epicenter. And it was that map, Steve Obermeyer's map, that inspired me. I was like, why don't I just create that map? Mm. Mm -hmm. It's Whatever the interpretation he made, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What he took was the simple data set and made an elegant story out of it, along with a lot of other people's work. But I thought if I could just reproduce that for the Columbia Basin, that would be a contribution. So that, that's a big motivation. In recent years, I think I've um, learned more about flood geology and become more interested in flood geology. I, frankly, I'm not all that interested in the floods themselves. Uh -huh. But I think there are new paths for research that people are exploring. What Larry Smith is doing in Montana, what uh, Pat Spencer and his group does, uh, students do here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other people doing new work mm -hmm. on floods and flood geology that maybe the Vic Bakers and the Richard Waits and the, and the Brian Atwaters um, didn't explore. Yeah. So there's new avenues for research. And I don't know if we've seen a whole lot of that in recent decades. And I think this is one of those contributions that can kind of add a little spice to the to the narrative. Well, good. I, I don't want to put you on the spot. Let's yep. let's pretend you're you're visiting this classic dike for the first time. Okay. And, and you don't have all your tools. And well, and, this is uh, this is the tool. Okay. Here are the two tools, Nick. <laughs> Ten dollar Nijirigama. This is for. Uh, I don't know. You buy these on Amazon, like by the half dozen. Uh, they always break at this weld. And they're ten dollars, and they're for like weeding, uh, like decadent little gardens or something. I don't know what they're for. <laughs> and then this is probably the most important thing. Oh, good lord! And you know you gotta buy these syrup tips. You know you gotta you gotta uh, be careful about buying makeup brushes at the makeup counter. Oh, you're the but, guy uh, going in and getting the yeah, makeup brushes. Makeup brushes. That's the key. So these two <laughs> these two tools are are really all I use, and then field book. Sure. <clears throat> um, okay. And I know that this is 10 centimeters from the weld to this point, so I can, you know, you get an eye for measurement. Okay. So this, this is what I, <laughs> the first rule is don't die. <laughs> All right. I'm so, excited, Scott. Yeah. Nick's excited. Nick's excited. <laughs> Just face planted into the plastic dike. All right. 
Uh, so okay. if I approach this dike for the first time, I would uh, ascertain its strike. So I'm getting a, a true width. That's huge because a dike that, you know, is at some crazy oblique angle, you're not going to get a true width that. So you excavate the true width. This one's kind of already done for us. Yep. So smooth it off. And then this really, it's amazing. You don't even want to see after a while. You go, I don't, I don't want to know that. I don't want to know that. This thing reveals just by brushing this sediment away beautiful becomes something it, it is absolutely beautiful these are delicate little structures that you know there's fascinating detail in here there is a, a similar characteristic for, in in almost all dikes you get sort of a suite of features that mm -hmm. you begin to recognize but this is what i do so right. brush it off and yeah, I could go up there, and yeah, I could go down here, but this is where I'm going. Yeah. This is where I'm taking the data. Right. And I'm just going to work across an outcrop. I'm not going to get a ladder and do a bunch of bullshit. So okay. this is what I do. So that's 10, so 12 to 13 centimeters. I'm going to call that 12 centimeters. Okay. And then I'm going to count the individual fill bands. And this takes a little more uh, nuance and a, and, a, and a developed eye. Here, it's pretty easy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that would be a generous count. Yep. You really can't put any more into it than that. Right. If I go a little higher, I might find that that number is six or seven or five, but it's not going to be 30 and right. it's not going to be two. Mm -hmm. So there's a variation in the number of fill bands along a dike and that'll typically scale with, uh, it, it'll be close. So what I'll do is write down eight and then maybe count down here and say I get six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. I'll write down 12, mm -hmm. uh, six to eight. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And fill bands, are there other uh, ways people have described these in the, in the papers in the past? Yeah, so, so sheets, dikelets, dikelets. fill bands, okay. um, infillings. Okay. Yeah. So we're not interpreting yet. We're just kind of trying to describe, and yeah. that's 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 uh, that's your label for these. And this is um, so you again. You've done this process with oh, what? What's your number now? Hundreds, thousands of dikes in the last yeah. twenty years. So I haven't tallied up exactly how many dikes, but it's it's somewhere between thirty five hundred and four thousand, somewhere in there. Good lord. So here's a typical. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, man. Do you care? So oh, let's get into the factory here. Look at this. Oh, so this is a typical uh, measurements I'll make. So I made these yesterday at Woodward Canyon. So just right. Elms Road, Wood, Woodward Canyon across, you know, just over the hill. So these are all my measurements mm -hmm. with the fill band counts in parentheses. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. I take a GPS reading. I write down where I am. Yep. I provide a number. I provide, I worked through the outcrop. That's all the dikes I could see. I make some notes. And the largest dike I found yesterday at that outcrop was 15 centimeters wide. Is that truly a new dike to you, even though we're pretty close to Whitman College? Yeah, it's a new outcrop. And even though I've got probably 100 outcrops measured here in Walla Walla Valley, yeah. you know, more data is good. Sure. Yep. You always find yep. something. Okay. Uh, so it's, again, just kind of from a distance now, thinking about these dikes that you've visited, it's common to have multiple it's rare to have one big fat guy it's not rare okay. but um and that that's a great question these dikes are composite features mm -hmm. because they're composed of different sheets so sheeted dikes are by their very nature composite features if we look at um a larger one. What yeah. do we head right down there? Good. Before we leave this yeah. guy, what, yeah. what, how would you describe the sediment size sure. between? Like, it looks like there's two different constituents mm -hmm. here, at least. Yeah. Uh, well, here you kind of see rubble uh, rip ups from somewhere else up upstream oh. in this dike. Oh. But in general, this is fine sand and silt. Mostly fine sand. This is almost all fine sand. The gray. It's yeah. Fine sand. With a little more silt as it becomes lighter. Okay. Now the silt partitions that divide one band from the other mm -hmm. are formed as this dike was injected. Um, these are crack and fill structures and at each cracking and filling 
you're dumping wet sediment down a crack and then that wet sediment diffuses outward into the surrounding sediment, dragging the fine particles with it, which form a filter cake on the edges. So these are called silt skins. Silt skins, not only the, the, the true edge, but even the guys in between are silt skins. Yeah, because if, say, if this, say, say this, just this one um, yeah. on the, on the edge formed first. Yep. So say this is the only crack that exists and okay. it fills with sand. Yep. Then it's diffusing outward into the host sediment and in the host sediment. Okay. But say this is the second one that uh -huh. forms. Then this is diffusing outward into this permeable sediment and the host sediment. And so you're getting diffusion of water just out of this wet fill into the adjacent whatever. And that accumulation of silt is the evidence of that leak off that that outward diffusion so the the drainage of the dike got it so the silt skins are truly fine silt and the gray is a little bit coarser, little sediment, coarser. kind of yeah. a fine sand yeah these these silt walls are always they always look like that i mean that is a classic that's what they look like but the fill varies wildly oh mm. yeah okay sure. oh fine. god so even right here so yeah. another oh no he's got the fever <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's so I've got a, a silt skin and another silt skin. Yes. I've got coarser sand in Absolutely. here compared to where we were before. Yeah, and so let's look up and down that. So if we take, so these dikes are stratified or sheeted, right? As you move across a dike, you see different fillings. Oh God, look at that! Yes. And then what the hell? And so. You've got this crack and fill structure that forms a composite body, a class, a sheeted clastic dike. Yeah. But just as you're looking at now, if you look within a band, and there are better examples. Okay. Why don't we go find? Yep. Good. Let's I see. Like it. Uh, wow. Where Where did I have a? I had one picked out. Maybe. Not great. I'm in already. I'm, I'm in. You're in. You're I'm in. Totally all right, in. All right. It, you know, these are beautiful little things. They're, they kind of take on a life of their own after a while. Well, sure. I think, you know, that first place, can you stand up there or is it just, let me oh, hog out no, a platform. we're good. We're good. Okay. I've been doing yoga. Come on now. <laughs> I only see you in that classroom, so I don't. Uh... Oh, here. This is perfect. Yeah, here, this will work. <clears throat> All right, so, yeah, that'll work. You good? Yep. Okay, so if we just look at this section of this dike, it's truncated by another dike, but let's just keep it simple and say between here and here is what we're interested in. Good and you know count the fill bands so there's something like 30 something centimeters wide one two three four yeah maybe five six seven eight you know half a dozen ten somewhere in there okay if we look so this is medium sand right yep this is sort of fine sand fine sand getting a little finer this is definitely fine sand this is almost all silt from here to there, six inches wide. That's, that's silt. Amazing. That's face powder. If we look at this band, we can see a different relationship that's really important. <clears throat> so, crack and fill structures. This is just one opening. We can see we go from medium to somewhat coarse sand across a little silt skin. What the hell? To fine sand, very fine sand. So within a single opening, you get a vertical stacking pattern where you can see drastic changes, yeah. abrupt changes yeah, exactly. in grain size. And all the time you see these, well, I shouldn't say all the time. Mm -hmm. It can be subtle, but there's usually at least one or more of these um, silt skins that's separating those packages, those vertical stacking packages within a single opening. Apparently, yeah. If this dike is sourced from somewhere out of view, 
that source is either different stratigraphic levels reflecting each grain size change. I see. Or it's tapping a similar stratigraphic level, but the source is changing. You follow me? Well, yes, but let me hold you up. So you keep pointing up. We have to be filling <laughs> these guys from the top down. What evidence do you have? Are you confident of that? I've seen some of your videos on YouTube and you, yeah. you seem to have good evidence. It was a debate for quite a while, or maybe is it still a debate? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, it's, it's, it, was, it was never a debate from the beginning until uh, uh -oh. so, some guys at Hanford got involved. <laughs> oh, no. okay. And those knuckleheads threw, uh, okay. threw a wrench in it. Okay. So the first paper was published in 1925 by a guy named Jenkins. Okay. And Jenkins was a good field geologist. Mm -hmm. I've got the article. In the, and mm -hmm. there was no question. These are downward injected, sourced from above, their wedge-shaped features, period. And the next paper published by Lufer in 44 said the same thing. And it was only in the 50s and the sort of the 60s that you started to see development out in, uh, mm -hmm. out in the Columbia Basin mm -hmm. that some uh, East Coast geologists and people from elsewhere kind of coming in and, and giving their two cents mm, yeah. and not just looking at the literature right. as it stood so right. yes these are sourced from above, sourced and, from above and i think at the next outcrop there will be no question okay yeah good yeah here it's a little ambiguous uh there's a lot going on here this is a pretty crazy outcrop this is so but i cut you off i kind of steered you away from that so you, you say within one fill band we've got two different sediment uh, sizes pretty distinct not a graduation from one to the next right and so now you're visualizing or trying to explain what was above to explain that change. Yeah, so if, if we explain these grain size variations and say this is a dike, yeah. one unit composed of different crack and fill, right. then either this band was tapping a different source of sediment than this band, that is a different stratigraphic level. Above. Right. Or the source for these is changing okay okay and so both answers are right these are composite structures and oftentimes uh, some of these bands are older than others and there may be decades of difference maybe hundreds of years of difference between a set of bands and another set of bands inside a single dike okay, okay? The second part of that is, um, I think there's pretty good evidence that uh, that these dikes, these sheeted dikes in the Greater Columbia Basin, are sourced from the circulating bottom currents in Missoula floods as that flood is inundating the landscape. Mm -hmm. Now that's interpretation, that's right. okay. but I think you have to explain this. Uh, grain size variation in either one of those two ways. You either are tapping a different level in the stratigraphy right. or you are tapping a circulating source. And that, let's say we have flood water in here, we have different grain sizes in that flood. Yeah, yeah, that bottom current would be, would be not only entraining whatever the local last flood dumped on the landscape, but whatever the local geology reflects. Right, so sometimes your bedrock changes, or you got the ring gold, or you got you know Chenoweth formation, or you got something else laying in here. So this is a theme that came up in the last field video. Um, I think many who are fans of the Ice Age floods visualize water. Mm -hmm. They don't really visualize dirty water, like <laughs> chocolate milk, as opposed to clear uh, clear milk or white milk. And, and now, in and, and the last video, we're visualizing maybe a milkshake as opposed to a chocolate milk, that we've got more than just some fine suspended yeah. silt in there. And yeah. you're seeing if these, if these can be tied to individual flood events, how coarse do we get coming out of a Missoula flood batch? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I've noticed, you know, looking at hundreds of outcrops, is that if you took like a dump truck 
and filled it with with sediment just like paw it off the side here and sort of mix it together and take a bulk grain size yeah you know you're going to come up with medium sand or something like that yeah it's kind of what it looks like right and the dike character will reflect that or be slightly or appear slightly coarser it rarely is the case where you have a a gravelly deposit like at Starbuck in the Tucannon River Valley where mm -hmm. you have a lot of coarse material and mm -hmm. the dikes are just all fine grain. Mm -hmm. The dikes will reflect what's available to them. Mm -hmm. And so this sediment is available to them mm -hmm. slightly higher and uh, and will fill fill mm -hmm. the cracks. So I, I think the sediment, you know, as geologists, we, we look at this and go, oh, it's a clastic dike. It's filled with sediment and it's this geological entity. But the important part about the clastic dike is not the fill, and it's really not the sediment. The, the important part is the fracture and the mechanics of the fracture, the way these fractures form and why they form. That's really the story. It's not the dike. Interesting. It's the fracture that's uh, being filled. Yeah, so there are three proposed origins that have been around a long time. Um, because these things occur across a, a region, Right we have to find a region a region scale geologic driver right so the trigger has to be regional scale so you really you really have three that make sense if, if that's your criteria so you have climate and it's typically been since these are pleistocene structures cold climate and so cold climates even at mid latitudes at certain places around the world you will find ice frost wedges right so sure. where you're freezing and thawing soil right and so are these freeze thaw action produced are these fossil ice wedge casts or fossil sand wedges um, there's no evidence of glaciation here mm -hmm. and we're 150 kilometers south of the withrow moraine mm -hmm. there's no evidence of glaciation in the blue mountains next door um, but maybe the Columbia Basin was really cold and we just don't know. Well, the fossil evidence and pollen evidence and other things don't really support that. The other ideas are large earthquakes yep. where you're shaking a region. And the third would be uh, mega flood loading or the disturbance caused by mega flood loading. So earthquakes is a really, you know, that's a tantalizing thing that, that bears on a lot of people's lives. We have the Olympic Wallawa liniment here with the Wallula Fold Zone, which we know is active. We've got just to the west the Yakima Folds and the thrust uh, system that's developed there. Yeah. The height fault in the in the Blue Mountains nearby, and probably some blind structures under the Palouse. Um, it's it's a perfectly reasonable assumption to say, well, these could be could be earthquake caused. Uh, the problem is, is they just don't show the geometry or the the cross-cutting relationships or the internal characteristics to to make that go. Um, because they die out as you go down. Yeah, first they're wedge-shaped, which isn't the end of the world. You could laterally spread a body of sediment and create wedge-shaped fractures. Um, but then you're not talking about liquefaction. You're, you're doing something different. Mm. And that liquefaction, that settling and closer packing and the expulsion of fluid creating things like uh, sand blows uh, sand volcanoes and associated clastic dikes like uh, the obermeyer studies and others in the new madrid seismic zone those are clear that's liquefaction that's fluid escape that's clearly venting sediment from a lower level to the surface and along the way forming clastic dikes and little volcanic mm -hmm. edifices. Mm -hmm. But here, uh, hmm. we just don't see those, um, those structures. I don't see those structures and literally, I, you know, I've looked at 500 outcrops. If I, the geology is laid out for you. If, if you wanna go find it, it's here. I love it. So we're looking at Oregon there on the horizon? Yeah, Horse Heaven Hills and that huge wind farm development. Oh, yes, okay. So Wallula Gap's just out of view to the right. To the right. And so the Walla Walla River is flowing left or right down that's, the trees That's there. right. And so it's Walla Walla itself is upstream a little bit. That's off right. That way. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the spot. 
I guess I was stunned to see these clastic dikes shooting through some basalt bedrock. Yeah, in places, 10 miles to the south of us, there's a great quarry there. Um, and in places in the Umatilla Basin, in places in the uh, Pasco Basin, places in the uh, southern Yakima Basin, you've got silt sand, sheeted dikes, intruding basalt bedrock. Intruding basalt bedrock. Yeah, tapering in and dying out. You gotta crack the basalt bedrock and then you gotta have this stuff fall down from above yeah, into or the fracture. Under some, probably some force, there's some pressure involved here in terms of the filling. It's, it's not just gravity fill. Do they look? Uh, they look identical. They do? Yeah, the only difference is in the Lewiston Basin, you got them in the Lewiston God, Valley as well. Crazy. The only thing different is if you imagine that this surrounding sediment is basalt instead of yep. you know, permeable sand, mm -hmm. uh, they lack a silt skin on the outside. Oh. Which is kind of makes sense because if you're gonna sort of dewater this this soupy fill that 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 floods in from from above mm -hmm. you can't dewater into a, a basalt it's I impermeable see. so yeah so the drainage issue there uh, shows up as the lack of a silt skin forming the outer outer wall which is cool but now that we're into the into the model idea and the interpretation game yep. so if we like Bring a Missoula flood in, mm -hmm. settle that water down a little bit, get it to slow down. I still don't get why the fractures are forming from that. Maybe you can help me in a second. But even in basalt, we're cracking open the basalt and something from a Missoula flood is coming down from above, whatever yeah. happens to be in that water. Yeah, that's, that's a tough nut to crack. You also see these, you know, if you just substitute the basalt for whatever the bedrock is, say over in um, near Granger, Washington in the Yakima Valley, yeah. the, the bedrock there, or at least older stuff yeah. is Snipes Mountain conglomerate, yeah. which is semi-cemented consolidated gravels, some sands, right. fluvial system. Yeah. And you've got dikes ripping through that identical to these. If you go up to um, Foster Cooley, near yep. Bridgeport, Washington, off the Columbia. Mm -hmm. The bedrock there is, uh, or at least the older unit, is the Ellensburg Formation. Okay. And you've got uh, uh, sandstone, cross-bedded sandstones that are formed in Groose, shed south off the Colville Batholith. So you've got inner beds in the, at the feather edge of the basalts there. And you've got classic dikes, sheeted dikes in that bedrock, or at least old, you know, tertiary sediment. You've got these same dikes intruding the Ringgold Formation. My God. So it's, it's not about, again, it's not about the material. It's, it's about the fracture. You're right. That's the fascinating part. Yeah, that's the common thread. And it's taken me a long time to get there. I think in part because in geology, we tend not to... Uh, talk about soils, we don't talk about engineering, right. and we don't talk about certain things that are just one step outside of our discipline. Exactly. You know, but if you open up a engineering in training textbook, uh -huh. which there's common every day, uh -huh. you'll find a fruitful discussion on hydrofracture as a common, easy to understand um, method of material failure. And we just don't talk about it in geology. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's no, you're right. something we could, we could introduce without a whole lot of effort yes. into a structural geology class. We kind of touch on it with more circle, but that's sort of an abstract way to do it. Mm -hmm. You can certainly come out here and look at these injectites or these injected features into fractures and find analogs in, you know, in petroleum basins or in uh, other engineered materials or in lab studies. You see, a sheeted dike, but see this like package of bands that yeah. cuts across this background. See, these are vertically right. oriented, but then this little package of four or five bands kind of is rogue and it goes kind of crazy through here. You would never see that if you look right up here. Mm -hmm. It just all looks like, oh no, this is the same sheeting, it's doing the mm -hmm. same thing. But you look right here and you get a cross cutting relationship of just this package doing its own thing. 
that's the story with these dikes. Not every band represents a flood. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. But a package of bands does. Mm. And that package of bands just represents a crack and fill, crack and fill, crack and fill episode. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way for a new fracture to form is to follow an old fracture. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I follow that. So th that's where the story is now in my work. So I'm explaining and making figures and doing, doing sort of the, the basic work of saying, if hydrofracture, then we should see these things. Yeah. Oh, it changes, doesn't it? Right yeah. Here. Pretty cool. Like a silt to a pretty coarse sand. You got the fever, Nick. You got the fever. <laughs> I can feel it. <laughs> Boy, how many people ride this road don't know about these plastic dikes now? Come on. <laughs> They're all the better for it. I got a... Oh, my Lord in heaven. Are yeah, you so, kidding me? So this is... This is not dike here, yeah. so you've got two, yeah. which could be a little bit confusing. But you see that beautifully preserved, you know, these internal structures are just, just right there to, to look at. Nice little fill cups, right? you got to have water. There's, no, there's nobody talking about this happening dry. Yeah, and, and a lot of times when you get into the coarser sense, well, here's a good example. That angle is more than the angle of repose for that sand if it's dry. Mm. Right, so you got to have water mm. wetting that. To, what to other evidence that. Is, proves water? Oh, um, the diffusion. So these silt skins are uh, filter cake. Mm -hmm. Very common in uh, the analog is uh, in heavy construction. Um, sometimes you'll make a trench. If you can't produce a foundation above ground, you can trench mm. a foundation and fill it with a slurry. Mm -hmm. And that slurry will diffuse outwards, forming an identical filter cake mm -hmm. on the edge of a, of a slurry wall foundation. Oh, amazing. There's, there's quite a bit of other... Goodness. Yeah, they're just cool. I mean, they're just kind of... I don't want to leave this place, man. Yeah. We're going to a different spot. <laughs> well, it's cool up there, too. I think also you see these rubble... Um, fills where you're ripping up something you know from above oh, and sort of entraining it oh. down and and that makes sense with with a fracture you're, you're gonna bust up whatever was there and, and fill it um, there's the no detritus. way to keep track of time like this is a, a week yeah. or a year or a, 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 an hour I think if hydrofracture then seconds Seconds. And then a, a large dike might develop over, you know, if it's in one event, uh, one flood event, as I would, I would say, mm -hmm. then you're talking, you know, not a week. You're not talking probably even a day. You're probably talking hours, minutes to hours. But one crack has to be uh, propagating at a rate to... I mean, it's got to be propagating at, 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 the, at a rate that seconds make sense in terms of time scale. Mm. Yeah, these aren't passive cracks standing 20 meters deep yeah. in this stuff. Yeah. It just wouldn't hold the crack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So your, your subsurface propagating fractures. Thank you. Let's just continue through and we'll work our way for the next 50 feet or so. Good. Mm. So there's our familiar gravels and some thinner beds in there, those lighter colored mm. beds that are sitting on top of the basalt, so unconformably overlaying the basalt. And then here's our siltier uh, unit with lots of bioturbation and, and evidence of cemented trace fossils. Yeah, this is a, I'm not much of a fossil guy, but holy cow, this is amazing. So little tubes and bigger tubes. What the heck? Three, three uh, scales of tubes. I guess <laughs> so. so. Root casts. Wow. Larger root casts, burrows, backfill burrows. Look at this. So kind of establishing a, a setting, a depositional setting. It's not really important that we figure all that out. It's just kind of we're working up through the deposit. I got you. If we keep going up, uh oh, uh oh, let's, uh, I'm not sure whether we'll see it well enough, but 
silty sediment, there's all our familiar trace fossils, and then we come, we rise up into a, a caliche horizon, a soil mm -hmm. profile uh, in this zone. So kind of coming up to a landscape that's somewhat stable and able to be populated by all these critters and bugs and plants. Um, oh, this is good. Elsewhere, just along the exposure, uh, those dikes are not as uh, truncated far down, so you see a little more of them above before they get cut off. And these dikes, well, I'll ask you, Nick. Mm -hmm. What can we say about the, just using cross-cutting relationships, yes. are these dikes older or younger than this stuff? Well, they're younger than yeah, that Yeah, they cross-cut this older body of sediment that's sitting on the basalt. Are they older or younger than the erosional surface? They are older. Yeah, because they're cut by it. Mm -hmm. So, above that... Is the stuff we saw at the first stop, so these dikes have to be older than the stuff we saw at the first stop? Possibly. Okay. I think the truncation says that these... All we can say is... These are truncated by Tushi beds. That's a flood cut unconformity mm. because everything above that is flood laid de sed sediment, right? Tushi if beds above. Everything above. We're not sure if this is flood deposited or not. Could be. Okay. Doesn't matter. It's old. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> These dikes are sourced in sediment that's at least as high in the stack as whatever that unconformity is, right? They're sourced somewhere higher than what we see. Because of your, your work with all these clastic dikes across the well, region, you know they're top down. Look look at the shape of this. Mm -hmm. This it's, it's, terminates it's, right here. This you can trace, and I've done it, it terminates at the top of the bedrock. So, so the, it cuts everything we've seen and terminates at the top of the bedrock. You can follow them down, they pinch down to nothing. Yep, that's easy to do. Okay. That's easily demonstrated. And so the source has to be above Somewhere above. This truncated. That's right. Unconformity. That's right. So the takeaway message here, or one of the takeaways is, we see what's sitting on top of the basalt here. We've seen everything sitting on top of the basalt between the Tushi beds and the bedrock. Mm -hmm. None of it is producing clastic dikes. These dikes are older than everything, or I'm sorry, are younger than everything we've just seen. Yes. So this stuff on top of the bedrock is not like liquefying and squirting things up. Mm -hmm. None of this looks disturbed. It just looks like it was here mm -hmm. passively getting intruded. Mm -hmm. But the moment we introduce floods to this landscape at that unconformity, which is complicated and has a little relief to it, we start producing clastic dikes. These are sourced in flood deposits that are somewhat cut out by this unconformity, exposed elsewhere in this outcrop. The dark sand. Here, here's a good, reasonably good example. Sorry. No, it's good. It's good. Good This is good. Is. Daddy's coming. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good sport. <laughs> Stiff soled shoes. Uh, oh my. So so the unconformity is somewhere here. Yeah. Is this surface. So old stuff, young stuff. And here's that classic Tushi bed look. Disturbed, yes. Dikes riddling through it. But this is Tushi bed material. And here's a sheeted dike. It's kind of faulted and messed up. But it comes down. Remember, here's our unconformity mm -hmm. somewhere in here comes down and soles oh, right into drape? it. Oh, wow. And and they a lot of them do that. I've poured all over this thing and they just do not want to cut that unconformity, which is weird. Helping. Now, okay, let's just play a game then. So you're still open to seismic sources for these. How would you tell an earthquake story with yeah, these so, two, two generations? Right, I, would, so, I would expect everything to go all the way to the top. Absolutely, if, <laughs> right. So if you talk about liquefaction or fluid escape right you're talking about if you just talk about the age of the fill of of a dike yeah in shaking 
you're mobilizing or remobilizing sediment that was already deposited. Mm -hmm. Some buried layer of sand, wet sand at depth, is responding to shaking and then mobilizing upward. Mm -hmm. So you're getting older sediment filling a dike, cutting across younger strata. Yes. In these dikes, it's the same age as the deposit. Right. Or it's cutting across tushy beds. So it's it's clearly equal or younger, yes. right? Equal or younger. Also, you know, this stuff is just as susceptible to shaking as this stuff. Right. Why wouldn't this right. respond? Well, <laughs> right. Because it didn't. It's just passively accepting fractures and these funny things we call clastic dikes. This stuff should have responded to shaking like crazy. This is perfect for uh, remobilizing. We're low in the valley. We're dealing with fine sands and silts. I mean, you couldn't design a better sediment to liquefy. And yet we don't see it. And we've got evidence to bedrock. So I think the association, if, if we can back up to the lowest common denominator, mm -hmm. I think you can say there's a pretty strong association in time and in space and sedimentologically between flooding and the forces generated by floods, whatever those are, and the formation of these sheeted filled fractures. I think that's the, the basic uh, place you can start from, and it's hard to poke holes in that. Now, if you want to call these earthquake features, fine. Come up with some uh, other mechanism or other uh, data set that shows, that shows these fractures were produced by some outside force such as shaking and not internally related to flood, the flood loads or the flood dynamics themselves. So, so I think it's important to point out, you've been, you've been visiting these things and thinking about this for more than 20 years off and on, and it's not like you locked on to this no. flood thing 20 years ago and you won't let go. No. You've, been, you've had <laughs> nothing but questions initially, and you continue yeah. to try to entertain as many open questions as you can, but yeah. you're removing some possibilities in your mind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this isn't my first day out here, right? right. I've been out here hundreds and hundreds of days. Um, so there is sort of a narrowing and a refinement of your ideas over time. As a young geologist, all I could say was, I got to be wrong. I, this has got to be wrong. I got to be missing stuff. I've got to be missing stuff. And I was. And, you know, you do that for long enough and then it, you're like... Well, I just wandered into this valley that I predicted there should be dikes, mm -hmm. and there is. Mm -hmm. And you go, hmm, maybe I'm on to something. And then a few other days go by, and you, you start to form up, well, wait a minute, that can't be option A or C. It's kind of got to be this. It's got to be something related here. And when I've seen things around the whole region, that's really been the solidification for me. Mm -hmm. If all of the dikes were tight right against the Wallula Fault Zone, mm -hmm. we'd have a, it, it had been long ago solved. Right. But because you cannot find, well, here, the Yakima Folds have been building for 10, 15 million years at least, right? Probably generating seismic shaking. Right there in the Pasco Basin is the Ringgold Formation. 8 million years, five, 5 million years from 8 to 3 or so of constant fine grain sedimentation lapping up against several of those structures, including the Saddle Mountain Fault. The Ringgold sediments should record layer upon layer upon layer of soft sediment deformation that we would call seismites if larger earthquakes were shaking that region repeatedly, as is sort of predicted in maximum credi credible earthquake studies. We should see a recurrence interval over the past 15 million years in the sediments of this region that would say seismic shaking. But you not only don't see stuff in the Ringgold that dikes. looks like, you, know, you see very few dikes uh, in the Ringgold, except where they're you know, yep. in contact with okay. floods. But you don't see 
interval after interval after interval like we do see in the Dead Sea region or elsewhere on the planet where you do have a strong case for recurrent strong shaking. Mm. We've got the sediments. Mm. It's weird we don't see that. And the only time these features show up is when Ice Age floods show up. Wow. Plastic dikes. Yeah. And Why don't we see dikes on the Palouse? The only place you see them is where flood cut coolies come through that lus. Why don't we see them in Holocene? I mean, there's some pretty thick bodies of Holocene sediments. If these faults are producing big earthquakes, right. we should see structures similar to this in our Holocene deposits. Look at Classic Dikes, how far north in Washington? So the farthest north is in the main stem of the Columbia as it comes out of Canada, past a little place called Hunters, and that's yeah. Sedonia, Hunters, Fruitland area. Okay. So at, right at Hunters, you have Clastic Dikes that are identical, Coyote Creek mouth. And how far east? Do you, you can't go into Montana, or can you? Yeah, that's interesting. I think anything uh, east of the former ice dam, no Clastic Dikes. In the so, floor of Glacial Lake Missoula. No, no. Right, yeah. Glacial, I live in the Missoula ba Glacial Lake Missoula Basin, and yeah, there's tons of work that's been done out there. And, you know, there's no classic dikes what out the there. Heck? So, so okay. the, the farthest east seems to be probably Priest River, and the, the features of Priest River are a little different. Okay. That may be a local story there. Okay. And then far west is the western Yakima Valley, kind right. of that zone, but... And then south into the Willamette, down to down to Eugene. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't, you know, like I wish I had a better data set down there. I just, it's just mm -hmm. a long way. It's Twelve hours drive. Oh sure. It's a hell of a drive for you to get here today. I'm gonna say. So wow. So yeah. I, you know, I, I think the association is in time, in space. We're within the floodway, always, below the level of maximum flooding wherever you're located. That that surface changes elevation. Here, we're governed by Lake Lewis, which is whatever, 330 meters or yeah. whatever. And uh, uh -huh. as you move into those outer basins, Upper Columbia, the Chelan, Pateras reaches, you have different deposits, but those floodscapes are still there. You still got scablands, still got rhythmites, mm. but the dikes change character. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So let's say somebody watching this is Super turned on by this stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Where can they go besides that tobacco root yeah. field guide to, to read your stuff or see? Do you have a YouTube channel? I have, I, yeah, I have a YouTube channel, but it's, you know, I really haven't done anything with that for years. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a website, skycooley.com, that I post, just a blog, but I post stuff there, and I have an Instagram page, Sky Cooley Artwork, uh -huh. and I do post stuff, and it's original work, and... and you know, I don't care. I don't have any motivation to publish yeah. in order to be employed. Right. I, I don't have that motivation. Right. And that's been a big part of why I just have steadily been working through the landscape and doing this and not trying to put out a narrative before before I've got a data set. That's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. So I'm writing up a, a manuscript now. It's extensive. I think I'll put it out as a as a standalone volume. I don't mm. know if I'll publish it or not. Mm -hmm. If there's other collaborations, I'll, I'm happy to do those. Sure. But um, it's, it's just really sort of a straightforward, data-driven, with a little bit of spice in the interpretation study. I think these things are awesome. They're cool to look at. <laughs> and they're so conspicuous. Well, it's, they're conspicuous. They're tangible. It's not like one of these things where you talk about the exotic terrains or something and you got to squint super hard, <laughs> to, you know. Where's North America at this time? Right. No, you know, put your freaking finger on it and right. dig into it. You don't even you need your tools and maybe not even that to really you know have some good wholesome fun out here, man. Uh, but what you've done is invaluable to just have this inventory, which is 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 one of your main contributions. Yeah. We didn't have that inventory before. Yeah, and I think that's right. It, you know. As more and more development happens, you see it in the Pasco Bay, you see it in Tri-Cities, mm -hmm. how crops are going away. Yeah. And if we didn't have such a enthusiastic uh, road crew around Walla Walla, a lot of these outcrops would be <laughs> sprayed or they'd be grown over. But we've just got a real uh, well, enthusiastic grading uh, regime here. <laughs> oh. 
Great stuff, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Or is it Ned? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder myself sometimes. No, I, what you're doing with that.